Okay, good morning. Bright and early. Um, well, early, anyway. Um, so today we're uh, going on to look at um, Evans on the causal theory of names, but I want to wrap up first thinking about color. Um, color re isn't really discussed in the texts that we're looking at, but I think it's an interesting case as a kind of um, exercise for a causal theory of representation. Because we do represent the world as colored, that, that seems like a datum. And in a causal theory, there's a question, how can that be happening? What is it that we're causally responding to that is allowing us to represent the world as having all these qualities of colors? Um, and on a natural story, um, the world out there isn't itself colored. The world out there doesn't contain these qualitative characteristics. The world out there only contains light of various wavelengths, not the qualitative color characteristics themselves, the blueness of the blue thing and so on. So how come we are managing to represent these qualitative characteristics if there is nothing qualitative out there for us to be causally responding to? And the natural answer that I guess many of you guys were defending last time was that um, it's something to do with our color sensations. We have inner qualitative sensations and our color representations are causally responsive to those inner color sensations. And um, the bombshell on which we ended last time was that this talk about color sensations doesn't make an ounce of sense. Um, I, I, this is... Um, uh, a dramatic claim, I realize, because it's a very popular view, not just in this class, but in philosophy generally, that there are sensations of color. But it seems to me that it really is a difficult notion, because on the one hand, the color sensations are supposed to be what we have most immediate knowledge of. They're what inject your consciousness of color into vision. So th they're what you have your first and most immediate knowledge of in having knowledge of our uh, uh, colors. But on the other hand, when you just reflect for a moment on your own current visual experience, your own current visual experience doesn't give you any knowledge of color sensations at all. Your own current visual experience only gives you knowledge of the colors of the objects around you. It only gives you knowledge of color as a characteristic of concrete objects. So you could say, well, I'm I'm going to hypothesize that there's something you don't have any direct knowledge of, namely these color sensations. And these color sensations would be like postulates, like the electron is a postulated object. You could say color sensations are like electrons. They're postulated to explain what goes on. And then you might form hypotheses about how they behave, just as you can form hypotheses about how electrons behave. Um, but the position you reach at this point is actually incoherent, because nothing can be both. Nothing can be both a purely theoretical postulate, um, hypothesized in order to explain what's going on, and on the other hand, the thing that we have most immediate um, knowledge of in ordinary color experience, what's providing us with knowledge of the blueness of the blue thing. I mean, you might try going down either of these tracks, but the current position is that you try going down both of them at once, and that is incoherent, it seems to me. So if we reach that point and we say, well, where is this qualitative character? Um, we can't take it as a given that the representations have it. Um, so it must be a characteristic either of inner sensation or of the world out there. Um, Actually, the most popular view is that we, we don't say it's a color is a characteristic of the world out there. And I think a lot of people would say this talk about color sensation, not most, but many philosophers would say this talk about color sensation is kind of problematic. It is not obvious that it really makes sense. So um, why don't we think instead of the qualitative characters of the objects around us as that's something we represent the world to have. We represent the world to have the blueness, the redness, and so on. It doesn't really have those qualitative characteristics. We just represent the world that way. And if you put it like that, you don't need to bother talking about sensations at all. Does that sound like a sensible view? Maybe you put your hand up if that sounds reasonable enough. I mean, you may be wrong, maybe uh, right, but it's, anyway, it's reasonable enough. Yeah. The thing is, <laughs> that was a trap. I, I think that makes no sense, whatever, if you have a causal theory of representation. There is nowhere really to go here, because if you have a causal theory of representation, then um, to be representing the qualities of colors, that you have, your representations have to be causally responsive to the qualities of colors. But where are the qualities of colors that your system of representation is causally responding to? There are no qualities of colors out there. We're assuming there's only the light wavelengths. There are no qualities of colors in here, in your sensations. That's the other thing we're assuming. So there's no way in which those representations could now be representing the qualities of color. I mean, a causal theory of representation needs two things. It needs the representation, and it needs the phenomenon that the representation, the representation is causally responsive to. So the point we've now reached is, we say there aren't the color sensations in there, there aren't the colors out there, so um, uh, how could the representations be representing qualitative colors? There's no qualitative characteristic sensation, no qualitative characteristic of the object out there to be causing the representations. Um, I think, my own view is, the only way to go here is uh, to say, well, if you talk about color sensations, it really doesn't make sense. It really is kind of obscurantist to talk about these color sensations when we don't understand exactly what they are and we don't have any everyday commonsensical knowledge of them then why not take the appearances at face value? Why not suppose that really the objects out there have the qualitative colors they seem to have, um, and uh, the physics is just incomplete. There is more to the world out there independent of us. There is more to the mind-independent reality than just the physics of the situation. What more there is are the primitive color characteristics of the objects. So if the objects really are in themselves, blue, red, yellow, and so on, then our color representations can have the contents that they do as responses to those qualitative characteristics out there. And we don't have to bother with this difficult talk about color sensations. We can explain the whole thing in terms of a causal theory of representation. But note that the pressure that a causal theory of representation puts you on here. If you've got the representation with a particular kind of, and is representing things a particular way, there must be something there that is that way in order for the representation to be representing it as that way. Was that a bit too fast? Do you, do you, do you see what I mean? Yeah? That's good. Sorry? No, did you say that was okay? That was okay. I was going to do it again. Okay. If you go to the causal theory of representation, then that's to say, you've got the representations over here. That's the representations, yes. Um, and a causal theory says the only way the representation gets to be a representation of that Q, let's say, is if there's some Q out here causing the representation. Yeah. You can only have a representation of Girdle if there's Girdle out there causing your use of the name. You can only have a representation of water if there's water out there causing your use of the sign. You can only have a representation of color if there's color out there causing your use of the sign. And when people say there's no smoke without fire, in a way that's actually literally applicable here because <laughs> well, I mean, of course, there can be smoke without fire. I'm not denying that. But um, there's something right about it, which is we treat smoke as a sign of fire. Smoke is a sign of fire in the sense that it's reliably caused by fire. That's all right. That wasn't too fast. Yeah. You see smoke, you can say, that's fire. That smoke means fire, you can say, right? The smoke indicates the presence of fire. That couldn't be unless there was usually fire out there causing the smoke. So similarly, you can't have a representation of water. The water indicates the presence of the water representation indicates the presence of water. The color representation indicates the presence of color. But it couldn't do that unless there were colors out there. Uh, oh, oh, okay. One, two, three. Yeah. 
the representation is itself the cause. So the rep uh, the cause itself. That's right, we get color representation from somewhere. That's, that's the whole point here, that's the central thing, right? Whether you agree with anything else I say here, that's the important thing. A color representation is not self-standing. Its meaning is not kind of generated from within. It's always generated from something that's causing it. That's true of representation in general. That's the claim of a causal theory, yeah. The cause and the effect must be two different things. Things can't cause, I mean, they sometimes say that God is his own cause. Yeah, go, 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 yeah. But that's a very unusual case. Um, things can't in general cause themselves. If you catch a disease, yeah, then, and you say, how, how come that happened? Then the answer just can't be what caused itself. You get another doctor to tell you that, right? <laughs> yeah, things can't cause themselves. It makes no sense. Uh, well, okay, you'd have to be saying this is a very special case, right? The whole idea of a causal theory is there's a water out there and the representation of water. There's a name girdle and the person girdle, and one's causing the other. There are two different things, and one causes the other. Yeah? This idea of a representation causing itself, on the face of it, it makes no sense. I, mean, I, don't, I don't mean to be um, pejorative here, but really, I mean, um, um, if you said, where did the chalk come from? How was it made? Um, the idea of what it made itself. I mean, how, how could that be? You see, you have to be thinking about color representation, or made itself. Uh, how does that work? Oh, yeah, wait, 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, you That's right, physics is incomplete, yeah. That's right. You, you could say that. I mean, it, it's a, a lot of uh, uh, brain science is actually very puzzled by this picture. That um, you do get people who go through assemblies of cell firing saying, "Now, where do we get the color qualia? Where did the color qualia come?" And you keep turning over these assemblies of cell firings, looking for the color sensations, and they're so hard to find. And you know, the truth is, you could trace um, a bunch of hits in the retina all the way through to the back of the brain, all the way through to the front of the brain, all the way through to action, and, and never notice color sensations at any point. Yeah. So it's very puzzling for the scientists who are thinking about where consciousness is. How, how shall we find it? And um, the, the, you get reactions like, "Well, maybe if the mathematics is sufficiently complex, and we will find the color sensations." But it really seems that it is not a matter of mathematical complexity. Um, the thing isn't there at all. And it seems to me at that point a natural reaction to say, well, where do the colors seem to be? They seem to be out there on the objects. Yeah, maybe you're just looking in the wrong place. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. Oh, I just said there's basic incoherence in the other one. Oops, going over here. Um, uh, I said that the color sensations are kind of incoherent because on the one hand they're theoretical postulates that we don't know anything about uh, directly. Yeah, they're just postulates, and that's the kind of line you're taking. They're in there in the brain somewhere, and future research will tell us something about them. Um, but on the other hand, they're also supposed to have this characteristic that they're the most immediate thing you have knowledge of in every individual experience. Now, I think it's perfectly um, uh, reasonable to say, I'm going to forget about this part, the special insight into them. Let's suppose they're backstage. Yeah. Um, I think that's, that's a perfectly defensible view. It really is obscure. Uh, I mean, you, you lose the sense that you, you have to, how should I say, knowingly give up the sense that you know what you're talking about when you talk about color sensations, and say it's just this postulated black box backstage in consciousness somewhere. And if that's the deal, then I have no problem with that in principle, but it's, it's not what many people have gone down. It's not what usually they have in mind when on the other hand, to talk about the colors of medium-sized objects, that we understand, you know, we use a million times every day. This is a robust, well-worked terminology, there's nothing obscure about it. So that's why I like it better, but that's what to say that's decisive. So I think the track of suggestion is perfectly reasonable. Yeah, yeah. Uh, this, this was meant to be a kind of, by the way, so... I think I've had a question. Uh, you, you had a question. Uh, you didn't... Okay, this is going to be really quick. Okay, well, one line, I'll try to talk for less than 20 minutes each time. One, two, yeah. No, you get color. Uh -huh. Yeah, uh, no, it's not translation, it's causation is the key thing here. Yeah. So I'm not saying your brain interprets, the, that's what the last comment was saying, your brain interprets the stuff out there as colors. I'm saying the colors are out there, and your brain just causes all response to them. If it seems to you like, unless you have something of a startle reaction, you don't really understand what I'm saying, because most educated people today would take it for granted that that's false. Yeah, that the colors are somehow generated by the mind. But I'm suggesting that that's wrong. Yeah. It's not wrong. That's right, can you speak up please? <laughs> Did you say it's not wrong? <laughs> no, I think it's caused by the color. That's right. That's how come you get a representation of the quality of the color. If it's caused by the wavelengths out there, you have no idea how it came about that you've got a representation of the quality of color here. That's the problem. Yeah, that's where we come in. With that basic difficulty. Uh, one, two, yeah. Last thing about why we can't have knowledge of Yes, right. Because you can't Yeah, well, the same when you try and reflect on the nature of your current color experience, you wind up just looking at the world around you. So, but if that's the case, then, like, doesn't that sort of imply you can't have any knowledge whatsoever of anyone? No, you can have knowledge of, of what you're seeing. Well, I, what, I, I, in order to describe what you're seeing, you describe the world around you. But that is knowledge of a mental state. What's, what's going wrong there is a picture of knowledge of your own mental state as knowledge of something in here, a bunch of sensations confined to your head. You have to think of the colored experience as something you're already seeing of things as something that connects you to the world out there. That's what causal theory is saying. Remember that, that thing about the thinker? Um, the whole point there was you can't know whether you're thinking about H2O or XYZ just by looking inside your head. The whole point about this, this is what I mean about how deep this causal theory goes, um, is that that picture of your mind is something separated out from the world that you can have knowledge of independent of your knowledge of your environment. That is being blown up here. Yeah. Uh, and I think that's what's behind your question. Yeah. So describing the environment, you are describing, you're describing what you're seeing, you describe your environment all right, but you're thereby describing your mental state. I, I, just, I just, I feel like there's a complex decision between my mental state and 
It's common, it's common sense, but it's wrong. <laughs> that's what I'm saying. Yeah. Uh, so I, I do recognize the, the intuition now. Yeah. Uh, yeah. That's right. That's right. Yeah. Well, you just have to, we would just have to uh, sort that out the way, the way we do ordinarily. I mean, like, it's like if, I, if, I, um, if I'm in a store and I buy a, I ask for a blue shirt and uh, they bring me something and I say, that's not a blue shirt, that's a green shirt, then, you know, these, these disputes do come up. Yeah, I've actually been in that, not in that context exactly, but I've been in at least one quite impassioned argument about whether something was blue or green. Um, and you just have to settle that the way people usually do. You know, you look at color charts, you talk to other people, um, you kind of get recalibrated. I, I don't know, you know, we do get into these disputes and we do settle them, but all at the level of common sense. Yeah. Okay, last one, yeah, yeah. What about what's that? Instruction is paid to, yes, right. Oh, that, that, that's, that's right, and that's interesting. Um, but, um, well, it's a complex case. But in the case of water, right, you can, have a, you can do a painting of water that can be meant to be water. Yeah, you draw, you, you, you draw that. There it is, the bottle that says Perrier. It's meant to be water. There's the glass, there's the bubbles, right? This water is all, all right. Um, but there's no such scene in reality yeah, for you to be responding to. But still, it could be that the only way you can have a system of representation in which you can do that kind of stuff is that there are colors out there. Sorry, so there is water out there in that example. The, the abstract painting is a little bit fancier because it's not, I mean, the whole, it's something about it. it's not naturalistic, right? Uh, right. Um, but I think with, a color, with an abstract painting, the thing is the painting itself is colored. Yes? Is it? Ah, it's a painting in your mind. Ah, <laughs> that's a very fancy example. Okay, there's a painting in your mind, but it's not... Okay? Right. L let me just make this general uh, point that it's one thing to say, in order for the system of representation to exist, the phenomenon must be out there to be causing you to use that system, right? That's what happens with water or good or whatever. Yeah, you can only have those representations if the stuff's out there. Um, uh, but that's not to say that every representation you form using that system has to be an accurate representation of what's going on. Yeah. So I, I that doesn't comprehensively address your, your example, but that, that's, where you, that's where I think you start. Okay? Okay, I just want to make one final remark that takes a bit further that last question, that what last but one question about um, uh, different people representing things differently. Um, if you say, I, I just say this to try and make clear what the position is I'm suggesting. If you say that um, the colors are out there just the way we see them, you have to face the fact that lots of other animals seem to have different kinds of color vision to us. So um, uh, goldfish, for example, seem able to uh, see into the ultraviolet. Lots of uh, birds seem to have ultraviolet vision. There are lots of birds that to us look drab and uh, uh, ravens and crows and so on. And then when you flood them with light in the wavelengths in which they see each other, if you see what I mean, um, they turn out to be differently, brilliantly colored. Um, so uh, if you take the goldfish or if you take bird vision like that, um, then what are we going to say about it? Is it that we see the colors right and they see them wrong? Or do they get it right and we get it wrong? Um, surely we can face off a goldfish. Um, but um, we, we do seem to be, have this question which is really kind of amping up that thing. They say, you know, it's one thing, I, I fogged you off by saying, um, well, we do actually resolve these differences. But with a goldfish, no amount of talk is going to be, well, I mean, <laughs> you see what I mean? <laughs> um, and really, uh, uh, so, so I just raise that, I don't want to try and address that here, but um, I just raise that to try and make clear what the view I'm recommending is, that um, it's a view in which the goldfish really is a threat. Um, so, uh, and the question for you is, if you don't buy that picture, then what causal theory would you like or color representations? Okay, that's one more. So um, we, 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 I really want to move on to the Evans now. Okay. Um, so I want to um, just whistle through and pr revive your memories of what, what was going on with Kripke. Kripke, Kripke, you know Kripke. It seems like a long time ago now, but you remember Kripke? Kripke, yes. Um, one way to think of it with Kripke is you can think of ourselves as having files on the things and people objects around us. I kept saying, well, the causal theory says someone radiates information about themselves into the community. We build up a cluster of descriptions um, relating to that individual. So you can think of that as each of us having a dossier on that individual. Each of us has our Mitt Romney dossier. Each of us has our dossier on our friends. You build up all this information is true of them. And then the question is, what is the relation that has to hold between the information that's in a file and the person it's of for that person to be the person the file's about? Yeah, well, how do you explain what that relation is between the dossier and the person? Um, and the description theory said it has to be the person who best matches what's in the dossier. And Kripke gave a quite different answer. He said, um, consider your Gödel dossier. Um, your Gödel dossier contains a whole bunch of information principally related to the person who proved these mathematical theorems. But suppose that the, uh, the person who actually uh, proved the incompleteness of arithmetic was someone else, someone outside the Gödel gang. Um, then uh, that other person would be the person who best matches the contents of your Gödel dossier, but um, that still Gödel would refer to the person who stole the credit. Right, that was the point. The source of the dossier, not the person the dossier best matches. I'm racing over this, but I assume that this is familiar at this point. Yeah. Okay. Um, so the key picture was there's an initial baptism in which the thing may be named by extension or the reference to the name may be fixed by description. And a chain of communication in which a name is passed from speaker to speaker. And what is um, railing up Evans in this article is the focus on the initial baptism. The thing about the initial baptism is that it might be lost in the mists of history. And who cares what the initial baptism was? Um, it, it seems to bear no relation to the necessarily to the way we use the name now.